Section 2.5 is called implicit differentiation. Um, the first thing that I want to talk through with you is what it means to differentiate something implicitly compared to what you've been doing. So what you have been doing, we haven't called it this, but what it is, is it's a called explicit differentiation. All right. So let me just pause. You guys want to fill in all the little blanks. So fill in the blanks, and then we'll talk through what this slide actually is telling you. Okay, so up until now, every equation you've dealt with has had y or f of x or g of t or whatever the name of the function is on the left, and it's had all the x's or the t's or the whatever the variable is that's the, um, dependent, the independent variable on the right. Okay, so you've sort of had them separated. y is on one side, x is on the other, right? Okay, and we've done everything from that perspective, and that's fine if we have the ability to separate them if they were given to us, maybe not separate. Let me show you my first example. You know, you see it on your paper too, but on this one, could I solve this for y? Could this say y equals something and actually go forward from that? Yes, we could. But if I do that, what's gonna be involved in this problem? Square roots, right? Chain rule, it's gonna be messy, agree? This would be, and what's worse is there's gonna be a plus or a minus because when you take a square root of something, you gotta put a plus or a minus in there too. I mean, it's not gonna be nice. It's gonna be ugly, all right? So either when something cannot be solved for y, and we'll see some of those in a minute, or when solving for y makes it really ugly and messy, sometimes it's nice to do a different method. That method's called implicit differentiation. There's pros and cons to it. One of the um, pros to it is it usually makes the calculations cleaner simpler, easier to work with. That's definitely a pro, right? It is. Um, one of the cons is that you have to remember one additional step as you're working with it. The additional step that you have to remember is that when you take the derivative of something that has a y in it, you have to write down dy dx, or y prime, because the derivative of y is y prime, and we can't forget that part. And when you're in the middle of working through it and you're sort of treating it like you treated an x, sometimes that gets forgotten. So that's one of the drawbacks. Uh, another drawback in general is that the equation that you get at the end of the problem will have dy dx on the left, just like before, and it will usually have x and y still both in the problem on the right. Okay? It's not necessarily a horrible thing, it's just something to be aware of. It's something that will happen differently. Okay, so you guys ready to see how this works? Okay, have I scared you enough? I don't really mean for it to be scary. I just want you to remember, realize that it is a little different. Okay, let's take a look at one. All right, so does anybody know what this is an equation of? You're close. If it were a plus, it would be a circle. Huh? An oval. Not an oval. It, not an ellipse. You're getting close. Ellipse and oval are actually the same thing. It's a hyperbola. Very well done. This is a hyperbola. Um, so we could actually look at the graph and so forth, but... If you remember from hyperbolas, um, they either, they look like double parabolas kind of, right? Like they look like the U shape up and down or the U shapes left and right. Definitely not a function. If you draw two, a line through it, it's gonna cross the graph twice in most places, right? Um, so this is definitely not a function. We can solve it for y equals, but like we said, we'd have square roots and we'd have pluses and minuses and it'd be ugly and messy and we really don't wanna go down the road. 
So we're going to solve it just like it is. So we're going to start with x squared, and you guys are going to do what you know and love to do. What is the derivative of x squared? 2x. Easy peasy, no problem, right? Okay. If the derivative of 2 of x squared is 2x, what do you think the derivative of y squared is? 2y. But here's the catch. y is itself a function. It's not a function here exactly, but we're treating it like that it is. So when we look at the y squared, anytime we take the derivative, we've got to put a dy dx with it. And I am going to use that notation, and I'll talk to you a little bit about why I'm using that as opposed to y prime in a second, okay? So the derivative of y squared is 2y, and then the derivative of y, like a chain rule inside, is dy dx. All right, what about the derivative of 25? Zero. Yeah. All right. This is the derivative. This is done. You're finished with the derivative. Now, your quiz, on, your gateway on Wednesday is not going to have anything implicit on there. You don't have to worry about this for the sake. Um, but we finished the calculus in this problem. It's done. The algebra is what's left. So what do, you, what do I mean by the algebra? Well, we want this to say dy dx on the left and everything else on the right. Okay. So we're going to simplify with algebra to make that happen. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to move the 2x. And then I'm going to divide by, what do you think? Yeah, in fact, negative 2y, right? So you have dy dx on the left. And we have the negative 2's canceling out on the right, and we're left with x over y. It's not bad, right? Only difference was that little step in the middle where I had to remember the dy dx. And then at the end, I actually have to solve for the dy dx because before it was already solved for automatically. I cleaned things up, but it was already by itself. All right. You can, and I will allow, and I'm not going to complain at you if you do, write y prime here. And you can continue the problem just like we would have before. Here's the reason that I don't care for this as much. If I do this problem, 2x minus 2y, y prime equals 0, how easy do you think it is to lose the little prime? or to look at it and think you've got a 1, or to combine it somehow with a y that's next to it. Notationally, that's kind of easy to do. I mean, you can be careful and you can make sure you don't, and that's okay. But for me, it's easier to write the dy dx so that I don't have that risk of problem happening. Does that make sense? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to continue with it being, and I, I've done both. I've taught it both ways. Um, so this is the way that I feel most comfortable with um, as a mathematician is writing the dy dx. So that's what I'm going to do, okay? All right, we're going to try some more. We need lots more than this. All right, so looking at this problem, which is a very interesting one, you notice that you've got a quotient on the left, correct? Which would mean that if I do the problem as it's currently written, I have to use a quotient rule. Do I have to do the problem as it's currently written? No, I don't. What would be a nicer thing to do than to do the quotient rule on the left? it'd be a lot nicer to multiply by y. So that's my suggestion. My suggestion is to write this as x plus 3 equals 4xy plus y cubed. Now, in doing so, I do want you to recognize while we got rid of the quotient on the left, we do now have a product on the right. It is 4xy, and that is a product. So we still have to do sort of one of the more complicated rules because of the way the rest of the problem works out. But I still think that it's probably cleaner than it was the other direction. Okay? This is a good example of one where absolutely we cannot solve for y. The way that this problem is set up, I can't just do what I could have done on the last problem. Um, at best, on the right-hand side, I could try and factor a y out, but I'd still have a y squared inside of the other factor, right? So I'm not going to have any success at trying to solve this for y and do it explicitly. That's not a possibility here. All right, so let's do some implicit differentiation. x plus 3, what's the derivative of x plus 3? 1. What's the derivative of 4xy? Now, let's slow down a little bit, and let's recognize, like I said before, that this is a product. So 
A product rule. What do I do with a product rule? First, I write down the first half, 4x. Next, I take the derivative of y, which is y prime or dy dx, right? Derivative of y is dy dx. Plus, and now I have to do it the other direction. Derivative of 4x is 4. And then the second piece, y, is rewritten. Okay? That's all of the part that's sort of underlined a little bit in that green color. That's the product rule. Now, on the next one, it's not a product rule, but what rule am I going to have here? I'm going to have the dy dx because there's a chain rule here. Okay? So what do I get when I have the y cubed? What's that going to look like? 3y squared. And then the derivative of y is dy dx. Okay, is everybody good so far? All right, the goal next is then to solve for the dy dx. And there are two of them, aren't there? So everything that has the dy dx needs to be grouped together. In this case, I'll leave it on the side it's on. And everything that doesn't have dy dx is going to get booted to the other side. So I'm going to move that 4y to the left. So I've got 1 minus 4y on the left equals 4x dy dx plus 3y squared dy dx. Okay, so far so good? Any thoughts, we haven't done one like this, but any thoughts about what we would have to do on the right-hand side next in order to solve for dy dx? Factoring is right. Very good, Nate. So we're going to factor out that dy dx. And if they have other things in common, I don't care. I don't want them coming out. I only want the dy dx coming out. Okay? So don't get carried away here. Just pull out the dy dx which leaves me with 4x plus 3y squared. We are so close to finished. Oh, I wrote it upside down. Yeah, it matters. I'm so sorry. That's what happens when I start talking and writing. Thank you. Yes, it matters. No, it, it's not. It would be if you had a function of x in terms of y. Yeah. We'll get to that second derivative, though, later today. So you just hold tight. Yeah. Thanks for catching that, Hudson. Okay. What do you think we do next? Divide. divide. What are we going to divide by, Evan? Uh, yeah. All right, so we're going to divide by the part that's currently in that parentheses right there. So the long and short of it is that my dy dx will equal 1 minus 4y divided by 4x plus 3y squared. Okay? It's kind of messy. I've got x's and y's on the right. Yeah? It's not near as pretty as the last one. A lot more algebra going on in that problem. Any questions? Okay, let's try another one. Okay, hang on. Sorry. There we go. All right. x squared y squared plus 37 equals 4x. Let's just start. What's going on with this first piece? Product. It's product rule. Very good. So I've got one piece that's x squared and one piece that's y squared. How will I start? x squared. And then I need the derivative of y squared. So what's the derivative of y squared? 2y dy dx. Is that it? Not yet. I need plus. Now what? 
y squared and 2x in some fashion. You might have those switched in order. That would be fine, but this is fine too. Okay, what's the derivative of the 37? Zero. Zero. And then on the right-hand side, the derivative of 4x? Four. Four. This one's a little cleaner than the last one actually, isn't it? I only have one dy dx. So what do I need to do? What's my next step? Subtract. Yeah, this piece needs to move to the other side, to subtract to the other side. So I have x squared. I'm going to put the 2 in front. 2x squared y dy dx equals 4. Did I miss something up? Um, I'm moving the 2xy squared, so I haven't got oh, there yet. The yeah, I'm moving this one over here. Yeah. Yeah, you're ahead of me, I think. So there's my 2xy squared. You're right. Okay, so I've got the 2x squared y on the left, and I've got the 2xy squared on the right. What am I missing next? Or what is my next step? Divide. So now I have 4 minus 2xy squared over 2x squared y. This is a good point for us to pause and ask ourselves, can I simplify this? We haven't had to do that on the last problem. On the last problem when we got to the end here, 1, 4, 4, 3, x's and y's, nothing cleaned up, right? There is no simplification, but here there is. What do you notice? There's a 2 in everything, right? A factor of 2. No x's and y's that can cancel, but the 2's can. So I can factor out a 2 and cancel out the 2 um, on the top and on the bottom. So this actually leaves me with 2 minus xy squared over x squared y. Any questions on that one? Okay, let's check out, check out one more of these. This is a little different. There's some trig involved, right? The other thing that makes this one different is I've got a product inside of my sine function, don't I? That also makes it different. All right, so let's start with the part that's sine. That's my outside function. It's chain rule. What's the derivative of sine? Cosine. And with the chain rule, whatever we had inside stays inside. So this is the cosine of xy. Next thing is that I need to multiply by the derivative of the xy. And that's a product, right? So we start with the first piece of the product. I'll use this in blue just to remind us. I write it down, x. And then I need the derivative of y, which would be dy dx. And product rules use addition, so that's what's next. Now I need to do it the other order. What's the derivative of x? 1. And then I write the y down. Okay, the other side. x squared minus 3. What's the derivative there? 2x. All right, this looks kind of ugly, all right? What I want you to recognize or to see when you get here is all you have is this piece multiplied by two pieces over here, right? You may not like what the pieces look like, but that's what you have. That sounds an awful lot like something called distribution. Okay, so we're going to do that. And when I do that, I'm going to move the part that's written not you know, the cosine part to the front because I don't want it to be sort of confused that somehow I'm going to multiply it by the inside of what cosine is because I'm not. So I'm going to write it at the beginning. So this first one I'm going to write is x dy dx cosine of xy. Okay. 
Okay, is the first piece okay? The other piece is just y times it. So I'm going to write the y in front. y cosine of xy equals 2x. Now what? The goal is to get dy dx alone, right? That's the goal. So what do I need to do? Subtract this piece. So now I have x dy dx cosine of xy equals 2x minus y cosine of xy. Then what? divide, right? We're going to divide by quite a bit on this one. We're going to divide by the x and by the cosine of xy. So I'm left with dy dx on the left. And then I have all those pieces on the right that don't seem to simplify, do they? Did I get it all? It's all right. It's a mess, though, isn't it? Definitely a mess. What's that? <laughs> all right, you guys ready for the next one? Yeah? How do the, prop or the directions on this problem differ from the ones that we had before? What's different? What is it? We get to plug something in at the end, right? You know what? Sometimes people think, hey, that makes the problem harder. But on these, it's going to make the problem easier. You want to know why? We don't have to simplify the mess. You can plug it in before you simplify the mess, which usually means simplifying is a lot easier. Not always, but usually, OK? So don't go through these problems and just say, I'm going to do everything like I did before and plug the number in at the end. I mean, you, you do that, and you can do that. But you don't have to wait till the end to plug the number in. You just have to wait until you've found the derivative. So let's do the derivative. What do you notice on this one for the derivative on the left? What rule am I going to have? I am going to have a chain rule. I'm also going to have something else too. Product. OK? So the first thing is there's a product going on here, x and cosine y. So to do a product rule, I write the first piece down, x. But when I take the derivative of the cosine y, that is a chain rule. So what is the derivative of cosine? Negative sine. Make sure you're putting a parenthesis there. Otherwise, it looks like x minus sine. It's not what you mean. You mean multiplication. What goes inside of sine here? Y, because that's what's already there. And then the chain rule kicks in. I need the derivative of the y. And what's the derivative of y? dy dx. And that is not multiplied by y. It's multiplied by sine. Right? I don't multiply it by what's inside of the function. I multiply it by the whole function. All right. Oh, I'm not done yet. I just about thought I was. How about a plus sign? What else do I need to do? Right. 1 cosine of y. The other half of the product rule, right? The easier half, actually, yeah. What's the derivative on the right? Zero. Don't, don't lose your focus on that piece. I know you all know that the derivative is 1 is 0, but it's really easy in the middle of doing all the hard stuff here to just write down the 1 and move on. So be careful. This is the point where we would have to clean things up for dy dx, right? Uh, but I don't want to do that. I'd rather evaluate this and avoid some of the cleanup if I can. So we're going to try that. X. What is X? 2. I'll put the negative at the beginning just so that I don't have to keep writing the parentheses. Negative 2 sine of pi over 3. 
I've got this times dy dx, we'll deal with him later, plus the cosine of pi over 3. And this is one of those places where you got to remember something about trig or know how to use your calculator well enough to remind you. Does everything look okay? Distribute the x to the negative sine y part. Distribution is always over addition or subtraction. These are just three things that are multiplied. Right? It's like saying if I had 2 times 3 times 5, we wouldn't multiply 2 times 3 and 2 times 5 and then multiply those together. So distribution is always over addition or subtraction, which is a good question. We just don't have addition or subtraction in this particular problem for the x part. All right, so I saw some hand movement kind of things in the air. I watched you, Nate, trying to figure out where you are at pi over 3, right? Yeah. Okay, so at pi over 3, there are two um, possibilities. You're either at 1 half or you're at square root 3 over 2. You just have to figure out which one's the sine value, which one's the cosine value. So your unit circle gives you that kind of information. And where are you if you're at pi over 3? Which quadrant? First quadrant, good. And are you closer to the x-axis or the y-axis? The y-axis. So you're something like right here. Agreed? So at that location, is the x value bigger or is the y value bigger? Y. You're closer to the y-axis. You've got a bigger y value because you're higher up on the graph. So the y value corresponds to sine or cosine. Do you remember? Sine. It's alphabetical. Right? Cosine comes before sine. X comes before y. Okay, so sine corresponds to y. So the y value is the bigger value. The sine value is the bigger value. This one right here will be square root 3 over 2 because the square root of 3 over 2 is bigger than 1 half, which means that the cosine of pi over 3 value is the 1 half. And I know I just threw a whole bunch of trig in your face, and I didn't teach you trig. Somebody else did. So if the language I used just confused you, I apologize. But come chat with me, and we can chat through it, and I can think through it with you the way I've described it if you'd like. Okay? If you think about it a different way and it works for you, that's cool too. All right. Well, yes and no. But so, like, the problem with the square root 3 over 2 is that it's not a decimal value. Your calculator is going to use something that's going to be a, a decimal expansion that's going to be non-repeating, right? You just have to recognize then what that means. So when you see that 0 0.86 whatever, you have to go, oh yeah, that's my square root 3 over 2. And you can do that. You just have to have that in your mind that that's a piece to remember. There's some simplifying here. We do need to solve for dy dx, right? We just get to do it with numbers in the problem now instead of with sines and cosines in the problem now. Um, these twos are going to cancel. So I'm going to have negative square root 3 dy dx. And I'm going to go ahead and move the 1 half over here right now, negative 1 half. So my dy dx, how am I going to solve for this? Well, first, let's just cancel out the negatives, okay? Now what? Yeah, divide by square root of 3, which is the same thing as putting a square root of 3 in the denominator, right? So this is now 1 over 2 square roots of 3. And I am just certain that no trig teacher... Well, maybe not none. If you took it here, I'm pretty sure your trick teacher did not allow you to leave that square root of 3 in the denominator, did they? Probably not. So what did you do? You rationalized by multiplying the numerator and the denominator by square root of 3. Square root of 3 over what? 6. And that right there is what my other child was doing last night in mathematics at home. The rationalizing, not the trig and the calculus, but the rationalizing. Okay, any questions on that one? Okay, I changed up my notes, so let's see what I have next. All right, six. Equation of tangent lines. That's like just one step beyond what we've already done, right? 
We've found derivatives. We've found derivatives and plugged in numbers. Now we're going to find derivatives, plug in numbers, and create an equation. It's just one more step. So let's give it a go. Does anybody know what this is an equation of? There's your circle. Yes, this is a circle with a very ugly radius. What's the radius of this circle? Square root of 27 or 3 squared is 3. Yeah. Okay? All right. We don't really care about the 27. It doesn't really affect our problem. So I'm happy enough that it's a 27 or if it had been 136,429, it doesn't matter. Okay? Because I'm going to take a derivative of it. And what's going to happen when I take a derivative of a constant? It's zero. It doesn't make any difference. So, however, this is one of those problems where if you wanted to, you could do the problem with a chain rule because you have something inside of something squared. Or if you wanted to and you want to distribute that out, you can do it that way. So I didn't give you the option in the last section because we were actually practicing chain rule problems. It doesn't matter to me which way we do the problem. It's probably the equal amount of work either way. So do you guys want to distribute or do you want to use the chain rule? Okay, I need to know by show of hands. Who wants to distribute? Oh, Josh, you're singled out. Who wants to use a chain rule? All right, we got quite a few chain rule options here. Okay, so let's give it a chain rule problem, chain rule possibility a try. All right, so the x plus 2 quantity squared, what will the chain rule give us for that? 2 times x plus 2, good, to the 1, and then times 1 because the derivative of x is 1. Do you have to write those ones? No. You don't have to. I'm going to just to remind you, but you don't have to. How about the derivative of y minus 3 quantity squared? 2. And then dy dx, right? Yeah, very good. So the derivative of y minus 3 would be dy dx technically minus 0. And this is all going to equal... Zero. That's why I don't care what the number is in the right, right? You could clean it up. You can plug in a 4. doesn't make any difference. Eventually, you're going to plug in a 4 anyway, so how about we just do it? Sound good? Why am I plugging in 4? So they give me x equals 4. They give me the ordered pair 4, 4, in fact. So. All right, so let's plug in the number 4. So if we plug in the number 4, I've got 4 plus 2, which is 6 times 2, which is... 12. Over here, I have 4 minus 3, which is 1 times 2 is 2. So this is 2 dy dx. Can we solve for dy dx? Absolutely. In fact, you probably can look at this and just tell me what dy dx is. What is it? It's negative 6. So either go through the steps to solve it or recognize it just visually. dy dx is negative 6. And that's exactly what I needed. I need the slope. That's what this is, right? So what's the equation of a line? We've already done this once today. What is it? Uh-huh. OK, let's get those pieces in there. y1 and x1 are both 4s. m is 6. Thank you. Negative 6. Appreciate that. And we're going to clean it up. y equals negative 6x. If I have negative 6 times negative 4, that's positive 24, plus the 4 from the other side. So this would be positive 28. Did our directions ask us to graph anything? Yes. Graph the tangent line in the same viewing window. All right, this is actually really difficult to graph because you have to solve it for dy dx, okay? So let's just run through real quick what it should roughly look like. It's a circle, agreed? Centered where? Do I have the space? I do. What was it? Uh, negative 2, 3. So negative 2, 3. There's my center of my circle. 
Um, and my radius is, like you said, square root of 27 or 3 square root of 3. Roughly how far out is that in a decimal form? It's about 5, yeah? A little more than 5, but pretty close, right? Because square root of 25 would be, 20, would be 5. So we're going to go out roughly 5 in each direction. So there's uh, 4, 5. We're going to be about right here. It's not going to be convincing at all, but I've drawn worse circles. And then somewhere we had the point. What was our point? Did we get the right numbers in there? One, two, positive three. The point's four, four. Oops. I'm not convinced that that four, four should be right. Let's pretend it's over here. I think I've drawn something wrong, but... Maybe I copied the problem down correctly. We're going to draw it in here. I don't think I've drawn it very well. We'll go with that. It would work out right if I had my scale and stuff there. Okay. I think it's very much steeper than what I've drawn is my problem. All right. We have one question left. It has this fun notation that Nate wanted to remember so badly earlier. We will do this one next time. So this will st we will start with this next time, tiny little bit, and then um, we will we will move on.